that. But, Connie, I want to bring you in because Ohio, to me, seems super important as sort of a litmus test for how intense the abortion issue remains for the electorate, both Republican, Independent, and Democrat. Let me play you the closing arguments from both sides in Ohio. Take a listen. Issue one would allow an abortion at any time during a pregnancy, and it would deny parents the right to be involved when their daughter is making the most important decision of her life. Here in Ohio, the state is trying to ban abortion, even in cases of rape. When I hear that, all I can think of is, what if it's my daughter? That's why I'm voting yes on one, to stop government from passing these extreme abortion bans. Connie, how do you, how's this looking in Ohio? Well, you know, they can still vote for, I'm looking at my clock, it's 7-12, mm -hmm. polls close at 7 30. Anybody who's still in line, please vote. Um, we don't want to discourage anybody from doing it. I'm very optimistic, I have to say. Early voting is higher than it was in August. And you know what happened in August with issue one. At that time, they had to vote no. Mm -hmm. This time, they have to vote yes. All these different ways around this. And uh, it looks like voter turnout will exceed August. Uh, this is tentative, right? We're st I'm getting, I keep looking at my phone as you all were talking <laughs> because I, people sending me numbers. Um, I've been optimistic about this all along, however. If, it did, if this does not pass, all it means is that the language was so confusing deliberately. Yeah. The Republicans, excluding much of the language of the bill. That's the only way that this will be defeated. But I'm feeling that that's not going to happen tonight. And, and you make a really good point. And I'm going to come back to you on this, Basil. Because, let me play Glenn Youngkin, because the issue of abortion, Republicans caught the car. They're the dog that caught yeah, the car. Yeah. But they haven't figured out how to make themselves not look like they want to do the handmaid's tale, which let's just clear. Well, this, a lot of them want to do the right. handmaid's tale. They're Here's Glenn Youngkin. Abortion. Essentially, he is trying to sell a national 15-week abortion ban on the basis of what happens in Virginia. Here's his closing argument. We've been completely straightforward and clear. Yep. I will back a bill to protect life at 15 weeks. Right. I really feel that this is a moment for us to come together around reasonable limits where we can protect life at 15 weeks. As we entered this cycle, uh, I had pulled together leadership and said, I think we should progress a bill that protects life at 15 weeks. The candidates that are all running have all agreed this is the bill that they would progress. Is this a powerful message Democrats are missing out on? I mean, the fact that Glenn Youngkin has sort of slid in under the radar, not seeming as extremist, but he's the book, he book banned before right, DeSantis, so. and now right. he's like, hey, national abortion ban starting in Virginia. And Republicans were talking about what happens if Trump does, you know, goes by the wayside, gets arrested, imprisoned. This is, this might be our guy coming forward. Maybe we can do a swap. Um, so yeah, no, it, I, I do think to Michael's point earlier, it's it's an opportunity for Democrats to really message this very strongly because you have also a speaker who wants to do everything that states are doing across oh, yeah. the country. Uh -huh. So we've got to be we've got to talk with a greater sense of urgency around this that I, I I do hear, but I'm concerned that a lot of parts of the party are not here are not hearing. Uh, Michael, uh, let's go to uh, Mississippi real quick. The Brett Favre using money that was intended for the poor to build his daughter uh, a cool sports uh, addition for herself or whatever, for, for her volleyball career, um, does that end up hurting him enough that Elvis's uh, what nephew can win? Uh, you know, that's a good question. I, you know, how does that translate for folks? I, 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 to be honest, just stepping away from it and being this far, I, I don't think it will uh, really factor. For a lot of those voters, um, there hasn't been a lot of blowing up around that. Um, and yeah, it was a it was a scandal. I think that's kind of uh, oh, there's blowing gone. up about it though, my brother. They're blowing up about it. Well, it's it's hurt his popularity. It's made him very unpopular, Tate Reeves. Yeah, but the question is, how does that then translate into votes? Being un Donald Trump is unpopular. But national polls have him beating Joe Biden. So, you know, I'm not going to I'm not going to base, you know, my experience in politics, I'm not going to base how a campaign is going to turn out around who's popular. unpopular. What I'm going to base it on is how Reeves and Presley are managing their ground game and how they're managing the vote and who they're turning out. Are they turning out voters who see Reeves as unpopular? Um, are they taking advantage of unpopul his unpopularity among Republicans mm -hmm. um, and using that to their adva advantage? So, you know, I think, again, smart tactics at this stage in, in this national election, because this is part of the national election, Absolutely. Joy. You know that. Absolutely. Yes. So 
Smart tactics at this stage at every level is critically important. And those of us in the democracy space have got to get smarter and quicker yeah. and team up faster yeah. around these elections so that we are prepared for what's about to hit us when this game really begins afoot in January. I'm going to give you the last word on this, Connie, because Biden's unpopularity is actually kind of frightening Democrats now. I mean, he's not winning in most of these swing state polls. Is that something Democrats should be concerned about a year out, in your view? Well, you just answered it. It's a year out. And I want to say something else. Duncan, no Democrat thought he was a moderate. No Democrat ever thought Mike DeWine was a moderate. He had This is a national narrative that occurs too often. Mike yeah. DeWine had a few months during COVID. But I have covered this administration. I've covered him for years. I've covered state Republicans for two decades. There is not a moderate among them at this point. And we are talking about controlling women's bodies. And if anyone, I was listening to another network, Briefly this evening, suggesting that this election will be over and then everybody's going to be calm and forget about it. They are so underestimating the rage of women, not just the compassion we have for other women, but the rage we are feeling that here we are, here I am at age 66, telling men still that they have no business trying to control women's bodies. You have not begun to see what we are capable of in this presidential race. Yeah, I think I've seen some of the numbers uh, out of Ohio that the percentage of people who are angry uh, about Roe v. Wade being overturned um, is something like 40 percent. And those who are uh, just dissatisfied is like 20. It's like seven in 10 are either angry or dissatisfied, but angry is the highest number. Connie Schultz, Michael Steele, Basil Smichel, thank you all very much.